In this video we're going to review simple harmonic motion. We're going to start with a vertical spring. When the vertical spring is not stretched it has a certain amount of length. Then when we put a mass on the spring it stretches downward and we're going to have a certain amount of displacement and we'll call this x1. If we put more mass, uh, let's say we double the mass, we're going to get even more displacement and we'll go ahead and call this x2. If we graph it on a force first displacement graph, we get a graph that looks like this. We get kind of a linear graph here. And the slope of this graph, we have a name for it. We call it k, and this is the spring constant. And the spring constant tells us how uh, stiff the spring is. If it has a large k, uh, then it means the spring is very stiff. If it has a small k, a small slope, then it's telling us that uh, the spring is stretchy. Now, if you do damage, if you overstretch the spring and you damage it, it's not going to follow this graph. So this is assuming a, a undamaged spring that's following what we call Hooke's Law. Using the force versus displacement graph, we can derive a relationship for the restoring force and the displacement on a spring. And we have a name for this uh, relationship. We call this Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law states that the restoring force is equal to the negative k, which is the spring constant, times the displacement. And now the reason we have this negative is because the restoring force and the displacement are in opposite directions. So on this spring right here, we have a displacement that goes in this direction. And so that is the displacement. However, the force that's that of the spring pulling on the box is in this direction, going upward. So they're in opposite direction. So that negative is there because it's showing you that the spring force and the displacement are in opposite direction. Another thing that we can figure out from the force versus displacement graph uh, of a spring is the area under the curve, which represents the energy that's stored in the spring. Since this graph has an area under the curve that is the shape of a triangle, we can use our triangle area of a triangle equation. And so if you take a look at the unit for the force, which is newtons, and the unit for the displacement, which is meters. And if you multiply those two, you get newton meters, which is also a joule. So which suggests that the area on the curve um, with a unit of joules is representing energy. And so here we have uh, 1 over 2 times the base times height. Uh, the base uh, is x. The height is the force. And we've already derived that the restoring force is equal to kx. So we can substitute kx in here and we end up with 1 over 2 kx squared. Our second method here is going to be using our work uh, equation, which is the force times displacement. And so if you were to pull on the spring, because the force is increasing linearly with the uh, displacement, um, we're going to use the average force to calculate the work done. Because this is increasing linearly, we can do that. We can just take the average force, and the average force is going to be 1 half kx, since the force is kx, so it's going to be 1 half kx times x, and uh, we end up with 1 over 2 kx squared. Since work equals a change in energy, um, if you do work on the spring, if you pull on the spring, uh, it's going to store energy energy in the spring and the amount of work you pull on the spring is going to equal the amount of energy um, increase in potential energy in the spring. Uh, we can say that the elastic potential energy, this is the energy stored in the spring, is equal to 1 half kx squared. So whether you use the first method or the second method, uh, you derive the same equation. As you stretch the spring and pull it farther, you have more energy stored in the spring. Next, we're going to talk about two quantities that we can measure uh, when we're looking at simple harmonic motion. And so the first is a pendulum that's swinging back and forth, back and forth. And what we can measure is the time. We can measure the time it takes for it to make one complete swing. Also, a we have a mass here on a sp spring. This is a mass on a spring, on a horizontal spring. And this mass will go move to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left, back and forth, back and forth. And as it makes one complete cycle, uh, we can also time that. And uh, the time for one complete cycle is called the period. Uh, so to calculate the period, we can, one way we could do it experimentally is to measure the total amount of time divided by the number of cycles.
and that will give you the period. And this is the time to complete one cycle. Also, we can calculate the frequency. The frequency is the number of cycles per second. And so what you could do is you could um, measure how many cycles, the number of cycles, divided by the time to complete those cycle and that will give you the frequency. Now you'll notice that these look very similar except they're kind of inverse of each other. Uh, so the period is equal to the one over frequency and frequency is equal to one over period. So now we're going to analyze a harmonic oscillator, which is a system that when displaced from it, its equilibrium position, experiences a restoring force F proportional to the displacement X. So this mass here, when I pull it towards the right, um, there's going to be a force on the mass towards the left. And you can see the force diagram here on the right. So there's an upward normal force, downward force of gravity or weight, and then we have the restoring force towards the left. Once the mass reaches reaches the equilibrium, uh, there's no more restoring force. The spring is unstretched, and now it just has a normal and the force of gravity acting on the block. When the box continues moving towards the left, now there's going to be a restoring force towards the right because now the spring is compressed and it's going to be pushing the box towards the right. At the equilibrium, the net force is once again zero. Uh, the north, uh, the normal force is canceled out by the force of gravity weight. And once it goes past the equilibrium, we once again have a restoring force towards the left. When the block is at the amplitude, um, one thing you'll notice is that the, uh, for an instant, the block is going to be at rest. It's not going to be moving. And so we say that the velocity is going to be zero. The acceleration of the block at the amplitude is going to be at maximum because that's when you have the maximum force. Remember, the more you stretch the spring, the more restoring force there is. So at the amplitude, you're going to have maximum force and a maximum acceleration um, because of Newton's second law, F equals ma. You also get the same thing once the uh, block reaches the negative amplitude, um, zero velocity and maximum acceleration. And then when it returns back to the uh, positive amplitude, you'll have zero velocity and maximum amplitude. At the equilibrium, uh, where x equals zero, you're going to have maximum uh, velocity and the acceleration will be zero. And that makes sense because the net force uh, of the block at the equilibrium is going to be zero. So the net force is zero and F equals MA, so therefore acceleration will also be zero. One of the interesting things about the period of a simple harmonic oscillator is that it's independent of the amplitude. So it doesn't matter how far you stretch the spring or on a pendulum how far you pull it, uh, the period is independent of the amplitude. So what, what is it based on? So for a spring, it's based on the mass and the spring constant. The period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the mass divided by the spring constant. Since period and frequency are inversely related, um, if we take the inverse of the equation, we can solve for the frequency using the mass and the pre, uh, spring constant. So the frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k divided by m. So you'll notice the equation is just uh, the inverse of the equation for the period. Now we're going to look for look at a simple pendulum where the theta is less than 15 degrees. So if you have a pendulum where you are pulling it away from its equilibrium, there will be a restoring force um, caused by the weight of the pendulum. And it's going to be uh, in a direction that is perpendicular uh, to the string. So we have a string that's pulling on this pendulum, provides a tension force. And um, the component that's perpendicular to that, the, the component of the weight that's perpendicular to that um, is going to be mg sine theta. And it's going to be negative right here because the restoring force and the displacement um, are in opposite directions. For theta less than 15 degrees, sine theta is approximately theta. And so uh, the force is going to be approximately negative mg theta. And because theta is equal to uh, the displacement divided by, or the arc length divided by the length of the string, uh, we can say that the 
force, the restoring force, is going to equal to negative mg s divided by the length of the string. And if we look at this equation, this reminds us of Hooke's law, f equals negative kx. And uh, the k here, instead of the k, here we have mg over l. So the mg, so k here is equal to, we're going to set it equal to mg over l. Um, because this equation has the form of Hooke's law. And so by substituting mg over l for k, we end up with that the period is equal to 2 pi square root m divided by mg divided by l. And you'll notice that the m's will cancel out. And this leaves us with the period equal to 2 pi square root. L will be on the top. G will be on the bottom. And so this is the equation for the period of a simple pendulum where you're pulling it less than 15 degrees. Uh, the period equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G. So L is the length of the pendulum uh, and G is just 9.8. So now we're going to look at the energy uh, stored in this horizontal spring. And assuming that there's no dissipated forces, the total mechanical energy, which is potential energy plus kinetic energy, is going to remain constant. So I have this block here, and I'm going to pull it to the right. And um, when this, this is where the spring is stretched. Uh, and it's going to have stored energy, so elastic potential energy. So I'm going to go ahead and put a... Uh, some elastic potential energy there and then as it gets pulled towards the left and it reaches the equilibrium that's when it's going to be the fastest so now I'm going to have the most kinetic energy there and then it's going to continue moving to the left uh, once the spring is compressed um, at the negative amplitude um, we're going to have all potential energy. Now in between the amplitude and the equilibrium it's going to have some kinetic energy and some potential energy. And then once it gets back to the equilibrium it's going to have all kinetic energy. As it moves to the right the kinetic energy is going to transform into potential energy. At the amplitude it's going to be all uh, potential energy. At the amplitudes the potential energy stored in the spring is going to be 1 over 2 ka squared. It doesn't really matter if it's negative amplitude or the positive amplitude because it's just going to be the magnitude. And then at the equilibrium the kinetic energy will be 1 over 2 mv uh, max squared. That's where it's going to be moving the fastest and so we're just using our kinetic energy equation. And oftentimes you'll be setting these equal to each other uh, to find the unknown. For example, you might be looking for the uh, maximum velocity and you're given the amplitude, the mass, and the spring constant.